we're going to continue our study in the book of Luke this morning. And I think that you'll find a familiar and beautiful passage in Luke chapter 15. There's a number of parables that Jesus tells in a row here. Lost sheep, lost coin, lost sons. But actually these three parables in a row in Luke are actually all making the same point. They're actually all making the same point, which is why we're going to look at them together this morning. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Those are the words that John Newton, the converted slave trader, wrote in a hymn that we now even sing today. He was a hard and brutal man who was changed by the power of grace. You can read about his story together with William Wilberforce's in England uh, in a number of books that are written about the topic and in the movie Amazing Grace. It's a beautiful account of how someone so lost, so hard, so seemingly beyond redemption was not, in fact. Grace is something that many people in Salt Lake area do not understand. So let me back that up. Grace is something that many people in the church <laughs> do not understand. People very easily understand law. Do this, do not do that. That's, that's pretty simple, right? I mean, you know, if, if you're going to start a new religion or a new cult or a new group that's going to move to an island or something like that, I mean, you, you kind of need your big ten. You need, you need your own ten commandments. You know, you, need, you basically need to come up with a list of do's and don'ts. And people will get that, and they'll probably, you know, join your new religion, right? <laughs> Somebody will anyway. Law, we understand. Libertinism, we also understand. Antinomianism, moralist living, however you want to put it. Doing whatever the heck you want. People understand that as well. And that is often a reaction to law. Maybe, maybe people grew up in a very you know, strict religious home, right? And it was do this, don't do that. <laughs> Simple. And maybe at some point they rebelled against that, right? And they went out into the world. You know, they became a person of the world. And now it's, it's moralist. There's no ground. They do whatever they want to do. And you can see both of those things in our culture here, but it's not just our culture here. That's the world over. I've seen those two reactions. People easily get both of those two things, law, non-law. But in between is something beautiful and something sweet called grace. Grace is unmerited favor from God that changes you. Grace is unmerited favor from God that changes you. Now, that's interesting. It's unmerited favor. So you're not, so the list of do's and don'ts, you're not trying to do in order to merit it, to try to earn it. It is unmerited favor, but it, but it, but it changes you. And so it guides you into what is good and true and beautiful. So you, you see how it actually takes care of both of those issues. It's a beautiful third way if we could put it that way. It's a beautiful third way. People don't understand grace. They think maybe they just need to come to church and pay their dues, and God will be happy with that and let them into heaven one day. But in order to understand grace this morning, what grace really is, we need to go deeper. And we're just going to dive right into the deep end here. Are you ready to go deeper? Let me ask you some questions. In the beginning of the world, why did God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden? Why did he allow the war in heaven with Satan and cast him down to earth? Why does God allow sin and evil on this earth? For one very simple and straightforward reason. What Paul calls in Ephesians 1, the glory of of his grace, the glory of his grace. Let me, most ex let, me, let me explain this. Let me tease this out a little bit more. God is most glorified in the display of his attributes. God is most glorified 
in the display of all of his attributes. In fact, that's why he made the world. That's why this whole show, this whole experiment is going on. It was a natural outpouring of God's attributes, right? I asked my son Moses one time, I said, Moses, let me ask you a question. Is, is a fire truck more glorious when it's sitting in the garage or is a fire truck more glorious when it is out fighting fires? And without even skipping a beat, he said, fighting fires, for sure. When it is doing what it was intended to do, that is glorious. When it is, it, its capabilities are put on display, that's when its glory is really manifest, right? The scripture tells us the same thing about God. The heavens <laughs> declare his glory, his praise, his honor. Even all this creation, even this whole plan of mankind. Everything is putting on display the attributes of God. Okay, now let's follow that a little bit. The attributes of God must be displayed in order to lead to his glory, right? And if God had been most glorified in the attribute of holiness, if he had been most glorified in the attribute of holiness, he would have created a perfect world and simply left it as is, right? Because that would have glorified it. Everything's perfect. It's, everything's in place. Nothing falls. Nothing changes. It's just perfect. He would have left it as is, but he didn't do that, did he? If he was only glorified in the attribute of justice, then he would have created this world perfect and allowed it to fall and then wiped us all out. <laughs> and justice would have been served, right? And his attributes of justice and wrath were at the forefront, so as it were. But he didn't do that either, did he? No, in fact, he created everything perfect, he allowed it to fall, and then he sent his son Jesus to redeem it back to himself. And that is the story of all stories that you find in the Bible. That is the chief message of the Bible, that although God had made everything perfect after himself, and although we had fallen tasting the sweet fruit of sin, he has sent his son Jesus and the Holy Spirit to win us back to himself, that we should be his people and that he should be our God. Amen? Are you following? Following with me there? His grace is what he wanted to lift up even above these other attributes. This is why he did what he did. Now, as we look through these parables, I want you to see three distinct movements that happen in each of the parables. I want you to see three distinct movements in each of the parables and see if you can kind of pick out in the parables where they occur. Movement number one, the owner loses something. Movement number two, the owner is yearning or searching for something. And movement number three, the lost thing is found and he is now rejoicing. Losing, yearning, rejoicing. Losing, yearning, Rejoicing. See if you can find them. Luke 15, 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her neighbors and her friends together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had. He set off for a distant country, and there 
squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and it began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was a still, still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what was going on? Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, You kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. I remember as a kid when I lived in Japan, when my parents were missionaries there, there was one day when my my father and my brother were traveling to Tokyo, to the capital city of Japan, and I, I and the, my other two sisters were there at the house, and we received a phone call. And it was a desperate phone call from my brother saying that he was lost in Tokyo City without my father. He was probably nine or ten at the time. And he couldn't describe where he was at in the city. And so it was a very, very difficult situation. And mom was going to try to call the police or my dad. So he hangs up. And my mom hangs up, and two minutes later, my dad calls, not knowing that my older brother, Matt, had had just called the house, and he was calling to tell my mom, basically, that he had lost my brother and that he was probably gone forever. Um, If you know how large Tokyo is, you know that's a, a real possibility. And she said, I just talked to him. He was able to go and find him at a police station, and when he found him... <laughs> He talks about how much he embraced him after he had lost him in that way. There was a great joy in finding something that is that was lost, right? Have you ever taken something for granted and then you lose it <laughs> and then you're desperately looking for it and then you find it and there's great joy in the finding and there's rejoicing on your part. Maybe you even call it together someone. Hey, I want to tell you about what I lost. Now it's found, you know, something being lost something being yearned or searched for, something being found and rejoice over. These are the three movements of these three parables. Did you notice each of those movements in each parable? You know, the sheep is lost. The 99 are left behind to go in search of that one lost sheep. And then it is found. And then there is great rejoicing. Jesus is immediately applying the parables spiritually. There is great rejoicing in heaven over just one sinner, just one sinner who repents and comes back to Christ. And I have news for you this morning. If you think that only applies to unconverted lost people, you are in error. It applies to you just as much. Because are you not also like a sheep? Sometimes 
that goes astray from the Father, even as a believer, right? Have you seen this in your life? We experience sin daily, weekly, yes. But there are real serious times where you go astray, and you need to be won back. You need to be found again. You need to repent in his arms. And there will be great rejoicing over you. And there will be great rejoicing over sinners who come to Christ for the first time as well. There is great rejoicing in heaven, Jesus says in this situation. And why? Why is heaven rejoicing with such a party when one person is converted and come to Christ? Or, or when you and your stubborn and hard heart are melted again in God's love and you come back to him? Why is there such rejoicing over that situation? Because you see, God has great, great glory in this attribute of grace. He delights to extend grace. You won't believe it, but he really delights to extend grace to you. He loves to open his arms to sinners who repent and are returning to him. In fact, like that, like that shepherd, he, he goes in search of them, or like that woman looking for her lost coin that sweeps the whole house and, and searches high and low. He is searching for sinners, and he is looking for repentance in your life as well. When was the last time that you repented and broke down in tears in the Father's arms? Bring the best robe, put a ring on his finger, shoes for his feet, kill the fattened calf. He is rejoicing greatly over repentance. Why? Because he is greatly glorified in grace. He is greatly glorified in his attribute of extending grace to sinners. Paul tells us that in Ephesians 1. You can read that chapter maybe when you get home today and see how it plays out there as well. You need to be found this morning. You need to be received and draw near to the Father. You need to be rejoiced over by God this morning. Maybe you didn't know that. Maybe you were just uh, having a busy Sunday morning and uh, getting yourself or kids ready for church or just coming here to, to do your thing. But do you know that God has a different attitude about it? Do you know that God is, is glad to see you this morning? Do you know that God is even at your house waiting for you when you get back? <laughs> He'll be glad to see you then, too. Did you know that he wants to spend time with you in the mornings when you wake up and seek his face? Do you know that at your deepest, darkest moments where you are mourning very serious things, he is right there with you, and his grace is extended to you? In fact, he delights, even when you have been hard-hearted, and you have gone away in sin, and then you repent, and you turn to him once again, saying, Lord, I can't do it. I can't do the Christian life. I've seen many who, who were so full of pride that they could not come to Christ. They say, I'm an atheist or I have these intellectual issues with Christianity. But you know what the real problem was? was a heart problem. A mentor of mine used to often say, the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. Why? Because it is the heart that must be broken in the presence of God. For you to really humble yourself before him. You remember like that son who had gone out and, and spent all of his inheritance on prostitutes? What does it say about him? That he came to his senses <laughs> as he was sitting in that pigsty. <laughs> you ever had a moment like that where you're sitting in the pigsty, <laughs> so to speak, and you come to your senses? It could happen on different levels, I suppose. It could be sin, the mess you've made of your life certain terrible situations, etc. You're sitting there in the pigs, you're feeding the pigs, and you realize, I, if I could only eat what the pigs are eating, this was, you know, presumably a Jewish person, you're not even supposed to be around pigs, right? Um, how far have I come? How far have I wandered from the Lord? He came to his senses and he said, even the servants in my father's house are eating, eating better than this. Everyone does well in my father's presence. I need to go back to my father. That's what you need to do even this morning. I don't care whether you're a believer, whether you're a non-believer, what your background is. You 
are in the sight of God this morning. And you are in the reach of his grace. His arms extended to you. You might, you might have been a, a Christian for 35 years. You may have been a Christian for three years. You may have been a Christian for three months. You may need to become a Christian this morning. But either way, the opportunity is the same. And the calling is the same. His arms are open. He rejoices over one sinner who repents than over 99 self-righteous persons who think they have no need of repentance. I think is the point that he's making in context with the Pharisees. You remember the very introduction to these parables where the Pharisees are essentially ridiculing him. <laughs> this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus tells the parables. Well, here's why I do that. Here's why we do ministry in this church this way. This is why we have outreach events and all are invited. This is why we love all in Jesus' name, no matter what their background is. Why? Because God <laughs> rejoices, rejoices over one sinner who repents than over the 99. So over some of us who can get real <laughs> comfortable, who can get real um, self-righteous at times, right? We even need to come into the party that is grace. Losing, yearning, rejoicing. The Pharisees are complaining. The older brother is complaining. Who are these people that think they can just repent and get grace and that's it? <laughs> you know, I'm a hard moral worker and I resent this. Have you ever resented someone in life because they received mercy and you thought they were getting a break? Right? We probably have all done that one way or the other. Come into the party of grace. God is telling you even this morning. Remember the, the older brother standing there. Someone put it like this. There's two ways that we can hold God at arm's length. There's two different ways, very distinct ways, in fact, that we can hold God at arm's length. One is through being a profligate sinner, doing whatever the heck you want, Parting it up, it's kind of, you know, any, any desire goes. And through our sins, people have made the excuse to me like this. Well, I, you know, I, I know that Christ is Savior. I, I know that I should, I should come to church sometime and he would, I, but I don't think he could forgive me. I, I have all these things going on in my life. I have too many things going on in my life. Their life of sin, they're using a life of sin to hold God at arm's length. The other group of people, the other type of person, is holding God at arm's length through their righteousness, through their self-made holiness. You know, God, I, I, I do go to church, you know, sit up, pay up, etc. I'm there. I hold you. I don't, you know, and, and maybe this person would never even explicitly put it this way, but this is what happens. God, I don't need you that much. Because I'm so good. I have this going on. I have this taken care of. You know, my life is pretty good. Things are going well. I have a, I have a well-paying job. I have, a great, I have a great salary. I have insurance if something bad happens. I have savings. You know, I've paid my dues. They can actually hold God at arm's length through their own righteousness, right? This is like the Pharisees. This is like the older brother who was actually angry at the father. All these years, you can hear it in his voice, right? All these years I've worked for you, and you gave me nothing. He doesn't even delight in the Father's presence. God delights in the repentance of sinners, and that applies to each one of us this morning in different ways. St. Augustine was profligate in his youth, and he writes of the life-changing power of grace in his famous confessions many of you have read that probably he talks about his own conversion in this way he says late have i loved thee o lord and behold thou wast within and i without and there i sought thee thou was with me when i was not with thee thou didst call and cry and burst my deafness thou didst gleam and glow and dispel my blindness thou didst touch me and i burned for thy peace for thyself thou hast made us and restless our hearts until in thee they find their ease. Late have I loved thee, thou beauty ever old and ever new. Someone has drawn a contrast between 
St. Augustine and Martin Luther, who had very different stories, and yet they share an intersection of grace. Luther was the opposite. He was Martin Luther in the time of the Reformation. He was, he was a holy guy from his youth. He was a very disciplined young man. He was training to be a lawyer when he then dedicated himself to the monastery and began to study and teach Scripture, right? He was, you know, lecturing on Scriptures, Psalms, Romans, Galatians, but he was legalistic to a T. He says concerning the time right before he came to understand grace in his introduction to his commentary on Galatians. Though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt that I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that he was placated by my satisfaction. I did not love, yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. And secretly, if not blasphemously, blasphemously, certainly murmuring greatly, I was angry with God and said, as if indeed it is not enough that miserable sinners eternally lost through original sin are crushed by every kind of calamity by the law of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, without having God add pain to pain by the gospel and also by the gospel threatening us with his righteousness and wrath. Thus I raged with a fierce and troubled conscience. You see, those were two types of person, the legalist and the libertine. <laughs> you know, what, what background do you come from? Where you're on the same trajectory, hopefully in Christ, to come to this intersection of grace. Those guys both came to that moment of grace. For Luther, it was when he was reading in Romans chapter 1. <laughs> and, and the light of the gospel was revealed to him one day in his studies from his legalistic background. You could hear how he's kind of ra- he was kind of railing against God. He was a, a monk, a scholar of the scriptures, yet he said, I loved him. I hated God. Why? Because everything was so oppressive. I was so beat down by the law. Augustine was, you know, with so many women, he was only with uh, wine every weekend. He was just, you know, he was living the profligate lifestyle, drunkenness, ad- adultery, etc., before he came to Christ, and, he, and Christ's grace changed him in that fashion. Remember what I said grace was, unmerited favor that changes us, unmerited favor that changes us. But it changes us in different ways because you come from different backgrounds. Are you a libertine who hold God's at arm, God at arm's length through your sins, your explicit lust of the flesh, gives in to every desire? Grace is the answer. Are you a legalistic person who delights to follow the law to a T? You want to have every T crossed, every I dotted. But you also hold God at arm's length because you don't need him, because you're so righteous. Both of you, both of you need to surrender to his grace this morning. And then you'll be like a beggar who has found bread, telling the other beggars where to find it too. See, what you need to do this morning is you need to receive his grace for your life. Again, whether you're an unbeliever, whether you're a believer, you need to receive his grace for your life this morning. And then you will be able to pass it on to others as well. When the party has started, like when the sun comes home, it's a party that continues to the end of time. And it's a party that we are inviting other people to come into as well. Even this morning, even two weekends from now, That's the whole point. We're going to have a party where God's grace is represented and others are invited into that as well. Have you received God's grace for yourself this morning? You know, some of you, you won't even, you won't even give yourselves grace. You won't even, (laughs) you won't even allow that for yourself. You're like, no, I need, I need it harder. I need to I need to be more disciplined. I need to, you know, I need to become more holy before I can, you know, go to church and worship God. You won't even allow yourself grace, even though God is wanting to give it to you this morning. That's that's a sad tragedy, but you need to just open your heart to his grace and realize there is nothing, there is nothing else that's standing in the way of you and God's grace. There's nothing else that you need to do before simply opening your heart and receiving his grace completely this morning. And that applies to you, believers, who perhaps have become jaded as well. 
then you need to pass it on to others. When you receive grace, you can become a gracious person, right? Kind of makes sense. The water flows in through a waterfall to your pool on one end, and then it flows out of your pool on the other hand to others as well. When you rejoice in God because he rejoices in you, others will see that joy happening in your life and begin to wonder how they can come in as well. It says in Zephaniah 3.17, The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you, in his love. He will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. You need to surrender to his grace this morning and stop trying so hard yourself. And when you do that, when you receive the fact that he is rejoicing over you as you repent, you will also be able to extend that same rejoicing and grace to others in your life as well. Amen.